Join us, friends. Great Scott, Spock guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost, Spock guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spock guy, and it is... Globe trotting with Shrey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey. But you know what? There's a lot of people that are. And what we're talking about is this fake world that we live in where people pretend like something is completely different than it actually is on the plus or the minus. And what I mean is, uh, and in fact, the Bible even talks about that there will be a time when people say that things are bad are good and things that are good are bad. But we're not here to talk about that today. What we're here to talk about is and we're going to bring him in. Uh, we've got a uh, man that is a singer, songwriter. He lives in Nashville. Just a, a renaissance man. He does a lot of stuff, a lot of cool stuff. So we're going to talk about uh, some music and that kind of stuff. And let me bring you in right here. This is Jonathan Pushkar. I'm sorry, Jonathan. I'm There we go. Here we go. Now I've got there you. It is. All right. Hey. A little bit of a glitch there. I'm sorry. So for thanks instance, for having Jonathan, me, guys. You're, uh, thank you for being here, Jonathan. So, Jonathan, tell us, I know that you live in Nashville. You're a singer-songwriter. In fact, the way that you and I met had to do with um, a uh, where I flew the drone over a house outside of Nashville, Tennessee, that Paul McCartney stayed at, Curly Putnam's Farm. He actually stayed at that farm for a period of time while he was recording downtown Nashville. Tell us about that. And you use that in a video. Yeah, of course. Well, first and foremost, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, really looking forward to hanging out tonight. But yeah, uh, you supplied me with footage for a music video that's on my YouTube channel now. You could see my name right there. It's spelled a little bit interesting. But anyways, um, I was super fortunate to get to record with Jeff Britton, who was Paul McCartney's drummer when he was here in Nashville uh, in the summer of 1974. And that appears on this album right here. It's my second album uh, on vinyl. You'll see the second to last song on the back is Junior's Farm. So it was really amazing. Uh, his name's Jeff Britton, of course. And Jeff has only recorded the song twice, once with Paul and once with me. So That's it very was, cool. Yeah, that is a That would have cool been the Wings, be man. And that would have been Paul and Linda and the Wings. Correct. That okay. came out in 1974. And... Uh, yeah, when I was putting together my second album um, in the interim, my first album came out in 2019, this one in 2021. Um, I was super fortunate to get to spend some time with Jeff Britton at Junior's Farm. We actually drove out to the farm and I got to film him and interview him standing at the gates talking about all his memories with Paul there. And it was just an absolutely magical experience as a history fan and as a huge Beatle slash McCartney fan. So uh, Jeff's become a dear, dear friend of mine, and uh, we're still great friends. And he's a big Elvis fan as well, so he'd fit right in uh, in this club today. But long story short, um, Jeff recorded the drums because it was during the COVID era. Uh, he lives in Spain, actually. So I recorded the stuff here, had some special guests play on it, and we put all the files together and assembled a mix without drums sent it to Spain, and Jeff recorded the drums there, and then we assembled the final puzzle pieces back here in Nashville. So um, it's kind of like what the Beatles just did with Now and Then with really assembling a bunch of pieces from everywhere. But it was super, super fun. And, of course, the music video, uh, you supplied the drone footage of the farm for, and we've got all kinds of unpublished photos of Paul and Wings at the farm. It's a real history trip if you're into uh, McCartney and Tennessee history for that matter. So cool. um, I – Thank you again for making that footage available, and I, appreciate I will you, never man. not be excited to talk about it. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> cool stuff, and for the guys that don't know, I'm sorry, Trey, what were you going to say? You'll have to put that uh, link to the music video on the video. On the Absolutely, video. and I did a video there at the farm as well. That's what I flew the drone for, was telling the story. And what's interesting is Lebanon, Tennessee, which is just east of Nashville, um, Paul would actually go uh, at, at Curly Putnam's farm. His son had a motorcycle there, a Honda. I think it was the XR 75 and it wasn't very big, but Paul enjoyed riding it. He went into town and bought two 125s. I believe they were 125 Hondas. And so literally there's people that tell stories about seeing Paul McCartney 
and Linda riding a motorcycle in the square in Lebanon, Tennessee, believe it or not. Can you even imagine? <laughs> and another funny thing with that is uh, before Curly left the farm and left it to Paul and Wings for those six weeks, they actually locked the bike up and hit it because they didn't want these rock star hoodlums to be driving the bike. But Paul <laughs> found it anyways, and everything you said is history. So that is it's funny. pretty funny. That is funny. And uh, it's very interesting. And But Junior's Farm was written by Paul for because of the farm. Yes, partially. Okay, uh, when so Jeff Britton... Yeah, when Jeff Britton auditioned for Wings, uh, this was, of course, before they came to Nashville, Lebanon to hang out. Um, Jeff tells the story that in the rehearsals, uh, in preparing to come over here, they were working through an instrumental, which was a very, very early version of Junior's Farm, like almost unrecognizable from the way I interpret the story. But the seedlings were there for it to turn into Junior's Farm. And then Dan Ely, who's a very good friend of mine, he was uh, a late teenager at the time. He faked his way into tricking the band into thinking that he was with Melody Maker Magazine. And so he got to hang out with Paul and Wings. They you know, pretty quickly knew that it wasn't a trick, and Dan kind of admitted what he had done, and they kind of actually liked him even more for that. But long story short, Dan tells all these great stories that um, you know he'd be sitting there out on the farm listening to them rehearsing in the garage with the doors up because they were preparing for the Wings Over America tour, which would be the next summer. And, you know, they were playing like My Love and Jet and everything like that. But he kept hearing this guitar riff over and over and over again. And it was something he didn't recognize. And so even at that point, they were still working through Junior's farm and basically writing it while they were staying on the farm. Um, one critique that the song has gotten over the years is that the lyrics are kind of on the nonsensical side outside of the chorus. But, you know, Paul does kind of have this imaginative side that he gets into, especially when he gets nostalgic. I mean, from the Beatles catalog to today, um, you know, you look at Penny Lane, there is a pretty uh, succinct storyline throughout Penny Lane. But even then, it's kind of whimsical. It's fun. Probably a lot of things that didn't actually happen, but based off of true events. So. I've always seen Junior's Farm in a very similar light where, you know, he would have been inspired by uh, little things that were happening here and there. And maybe it was just things that the band would only know. Uh, but, yeah, I've always thought that that was really interesting. That is interesting. I actually know Dan Ely. Oh, uh, yeah, he's a great friend of mine. We were talking earlier today, actually. Really? And his brother lives here in Hendersonville. I know his his brother, Gary. Oh, amazing. And, um, and he's a big Elvis guy, too. So Yes. <laughs> and uh, and Dan, and I'm trying to remember, didn't Dan take his bass and yes. get Paul to play it? Was it a Rickenbacker? Am I remembering that right? Yes, it's a right-handed Rickenbacker, okay. uh, a lot like Paul's with, you know, being blonde and things like that. Yeah. And uh, Dan had given it to Denny Lane to give to Paul. And Dan tells the story better than anybody. But basically, Paul gave Dan back the bass. And uh, Dan ended up selling that bass that Paul had played in the garage. And years later, after literally years of searching, it turned up in a pawn shop of all places. I remember that. He was able to match the photos, like the wood grain and everything. It's a great story. There's videos out on YouTube on his channel you can check out. But uh, yeah, it's it's really amazing uh, the way that bass came back. I've held that bass. I've played it. It's super, super cool. But uh, yeah, Dan hung out with those guys on the farm. And then on my Junior's Farm cover that had Jeff Britton on drums, I had Dan play that bass on the song. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. Cool. And my video is like the biggest love letter to Paul's time in Nashville that could ever exist. If that's, I could say so as humbly as possible. <laughs> that's very cool. And so for people that don't know, if you're not a, a regular Beatles fan, Paul was left-handed. So he would generally right. play, he would play his bass back, what I would call backwards. So he had to play that bass upside down. He would have turned right. it over. There are photos. There are photos playing the other there, way. though. Yeah, like where he'll play a right-handed guitar, even upside down, not even strung. So he's even playing the chords upside down, which... Yeah. You know, if you want to dispute that Paul is the greatest living musician ever, yeah. I'm going to show you a photo of him playing a left-handed guitar backwards and upside down yeah. and tell you that guy also wrote Yesterday and the Long and Winding Road. I mean, yeah. he's just the greatest there ever yeah. was. I knew a it's guy, incredible. when I played music in North Carolina, there was a guy uh, that was a really, really good guitar player, really good lead player. 
and he played right-handed, but he played a left-handed guitar upside down. Wow. And uh, so the little string was on the top, but he could, man, he could smoke that guitar. Unbelievable player. But he played wow. backwards. Yeah. He, whoever he learned from had a left-handed guitar, and he just flipped it over and played it right-handed upside down and learned like that, which is wow. Cool. Yeah. So show us some of your guitars. I know that you have a lot of uh, uh, Beatles influence in in your guitars that you have. I, as I mentioned, I have a Rickenbacker 4001, but my influence would have been Rush. Uh, I was Getty in a Rush cover band way oh, back fun. in the 80s. And so I still have my Rickenbacker, and I had a Steinberger. Of course, he went from the Rickenbacker to a Steinberger. And uh, later, wall basses is what he played. But you have, and I still have mine that I bought. I bought that thing in 1984. I actually um, put it on layaway and made payments on it. And I still have all the paperwork where I bought it. Oh, I love and, that. Um, uh, but anyway, you have some really cool Rickenbackers. Would you like to show them? Yeah, sure. So, this is a model 1997 Rickenbacker. Uh, this is called a Rose Morris version. And that's because the F hole here is a true like F hole the way you think of it. And Rose Morris was named after a music store in England who were the only stores in the world to get this F hole. So that's why you see like Pete Townsend's Rickenbackers and Denny Lane when he was with the Moody Blues, the Kinks, theirs all have the F holes. Whereas like Roger McGuinn uh, from the Birds, his has what's called the Cat Eye. I'll show you another guitar here that has that in a second. But this one was made in 1987 and I got this in... Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when I lived up there. Um, I was working in a music store at the time and this walked in and I just had to have it. And so I play this all the time. This is my guitar of choice. I absolutely love it. And, and so I call me, it my- Ken, so, Let me explain one thing real quick. So what he's talking about an F hole is a actual cutout. There's some right. that have, and that's what we call an open F hole. There's some guitars that have painted on F holes. Okay. Is that what you're talking about, the cat eye? Yes. And most right. times I actually have a guitar with a painted on F hole that I could reach right here and grab. It but is my there. friend is bringing it over tomorrow. He's oh, okay. been working on it. So um, the cat eye one, but, is what's um, seen here. That's the cat eye. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So it's yeah, just it's, slit in there. Okay. Yep. And this is the George Harrison 12 string model from Rickenbacker. And of course, that's the Hard Day's Night guitar. Open chord. Yeah. Absolutely love this one too. It's, it's a really guitar. cool one. I had a blue 12 string that I traded for this one. And then my last Rickenbacker that I have within reach is this guy here. This is the John Lennon 325. Just to show you when I like hold it, how tiny it is, the entire guitar can fit in the frame. Yeah. It is three it quarters is scale. And the cool story with uh, this model guitar is. You know, when the Beatles were getting started, finding an American guitar in England was basically impossible because of the imports and things like that. So you would have to know a sailor who could bring you back one from New York or something like that. And, you know, what kid in Liverpool would have that opportunity? So uh, make a very long story short, John found his Rickenbacker 325 in Hamburg, Germany. And basically, he bought it because he recognized a 45 sleeve that he had where they had a Rickenbacker guitar, but he didn't even take into account the fact that it was a three-quarter scale guitar. So it's very, very small. And, uh, you know, I'm, I suppose, fortunate in this one case that uh, I'm not the tallest person in any party that I attend. So this guitar actually fits me pretty well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you see some of these like Beatles tribute band guys where the guy who's playing John Lennon is 6'4". And I mean, this looks like a kid's guitar on <laughs> yeah. the average guy. So yeah. it is cool. It's not super versatile. It's like really good for John Lennon songs, rhythm guitar songs. And that's literally about it. Yeah. Um, it's a great guitar, but it's definitely a little bit more in the uh, novelty vein. And I guess I can show you one more guitar. This guy here is my George Harrison Duo Jet. This is an actual George Harrison signature series. And this is an That's exact great. replica. Yes, this is an exact replica of what he played in the cavern. Now, they did 70 of these to celebrate George's 70th birthday. And those were custom shop ones that had every nick, ding, scratch, road wear. This is not that. This is just the regular 
line of guitars. There's, you know, many of these out there. But a couple of cool things that they did is the back is painted black because George spray painted the back of his guitar black and John spray painted that one black too. Another cool thing is down here where the uh, strap peg is, it's supposed to go right here in the Bigsby, mm -hmm. but the Beatles played so much that he actually broke and stripped this out. So he had to drill another hole here where uh, the strap peg is. And so they yeah. did that on this model. And then the other cool thing is I got this in 2011 directly from Gretsch. I was in a Beatles tribute band at the time. And Fred Gretsch, the CEO, signed oh, wow. the back of the guitar. So. That is very cool. Yeah, definitely a cool one. And I think I'm just going to hold it from here on out because it yeah. feels comfy to hold. And, <laughs> and I learned to play on a Gretsch. I, I have it. And it's got a painted on F hole. If it was easier to get to, I would go get it. But that's what I learned on. My dad bought a, um, it's a 1961 uh, Country Gentleman 6120. Oh, and wow. I still have it. My father bought it brand new in 1961. And that's the guitar that I learned on. Now, wow, it's a hollow amazing. body, but it has painted on F holes. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. I'd love to see that sometime. Yeah. It's a cool guitar. Now, it's been treated a little rough. It got some, some, um, moisture damage one time and some things, but it's still, it's the one from my childhood. So I cherish it, you know, that kind of thing. And those old Gretches, even the best taken care of ones, the binding starts oh, to right. crumble yeah. on them. It's just the material it was yeah. made with. Um, yeah. So a lot of them need that to be fixed eventually, even yeah. if it's still good today, it's probably going to happen eventually. Yeah. But, no matter what. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big guitar guy. The other thing I can't really show on camera just by nature of this is, um, Earlier this year, I bought a Marshall amp that was owned by Scotty Moore. Oh, wow. Uh, it was his, Yeah, it was his studio amp here in Nashville from like the mid 80s, basically until the end of his life because it came from his estate. And uh, it's a really cool amp. And what I did is I brought it home. I plugged this guitar into it. I didn't touch anything except the volume just to turn up the volume. And I turned it on and boom, 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 boom. it's like the tone <laughs> is perfect so yeah. i took a picture of the knobs so that if they ever get bumped or anything i can put it exactly the way scotty yeah. left it but it is pretty bonkers to think like if it was his studio amp who else would have played through it other than me and him yeah so that's cool when stuff. i bring people over to my house and show them through my collection everybody gets to play the rickenbacker 12 string play the george harrison chord and you get to at least strum something through the scotty Moore amp to yeah. say you got to play it too oh, so. oh, guy. Okay. Do what? You probably saw that amp. I did, that. and uh, I actually got to play through the Ray Butts amp. Um, Very and, cool. Uh, when I was over, you know, I was friends with Scotty and in business with Scotty, and and uh, he got several guitars out, and uh, he had he didn't have any of the original Elvis guitars. You know, he so because he didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know, but he, he had, gave away a lot of stuff too. He did he gave it away. He traded the uh, the one from the '68 comeback to Chips Moman for some studio equipment some mics and some different stuff oh and the um so he just over a period of time just didn't think of it he just traded stuff and did things you know but he had a cool guitar that um the the story goes uh, and i hate to take up time with this but i'll tell it really quick the story goes that uh chet atkins went to they used to own a tape duplication shop uh scotty did along with um his girlfriend and her name is escaping me right this moment um Oh, uh, maybe it'll it'll come to me. But she said that Ch Chet came to the tape duplication shop to drop off something and said, "Hey, do those mics?" Uh, Scotty had taken some 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 of those sure what we would call an Elvis mic, you know, the big head Elvis mm -hmm. mics, and mounted them to wood pedestals and had them hmm. played in there. And he said, "Do any of those mics work?" And she said, "Well, I don't know." He said, "Let me have that one and that one." So he took them. The next day, he brought a guitar back and left it for Scotty to pay for the to trade for the mics, and it was a uh, a one off that get, that Gibson had made for, him. and so Scotty was gifted that. So Scotty thought so Whoa. much of that guitar. I got to play it, but Scotty thought so much of that guitar because Chet owned it and it was made for him that he wouldn't even take it out to play. He had a duplicate made by Gibson wow. that he could take oh out. Oh my and play. gosh. And so I got to play both of those guitars and play through the amps. And I now own in his, um, in his, uh, you know, as a guitar player, you always have a tool bag. You've got a always. bag that you keep stuff with and for, you know, your uh, 
screwdrivers and pliers and cutting pliers and stuff for changing strings. He always kept a pick in there that was made from a coin. And I have that pick. That and and he had that pick made. He made it when he was in the Navy when he couldn't buy a guitar pick. He had to make one. And he kept wow. it in that bag from the Navy all the way through the end of his life. And I have it. Oh my God. And I also wow. have a, a Fender volume pedal that belonged to him. So I have several things that are guitar related from Scotty. But anyway, I'm sorry dude, we got off on that. We got to put my amp with all that stuff and we could ring one chord out for Scott. That would be really cool. Gear. That would That'd be pretty be really cool. cool. With his, with his uh, special pick. That's yeah, right. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, we got to do that. That pick, that pick was on all those early. It was on all those albums. tours. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. cool right there. And my friend has, uh, me and you need to make a trip to Memphis and, uh, and, we can play the uh, the ES two ninety five. My friend owns. Oh my gosh! And uh, wow, you want to leave in the morning? I'm good yeah, to go. Exactly. He's got the two ninety five. He's got um. He's got the guitar that uh, in Viva Las Vegas where he fell in the pool. He's got that guitar. Oh he's got he the has, one uh, from Follow That Dream where he's playing it. You know, laying on the porch in the house playing. He it. has the wow. first guitar that Elvis gave to Red, and he had told Red he's got the very first, first guitar. guitar. From two mm -hmm. Okay, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So yes. you know who it is. He's got <laughs> yeah. Scotty's guitar. We're friends as well. Yeah. It's, he it's also incredible. has um he's got uh Bill Black's first electric bass. Oh yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I was at his house in 2018 or 2019, yeah. I believe. And oh my gosh, yeah, that's that as crazy as it is, everything you just mentioned is scratching the surface of that's this collection. Yeah, it's just, just incredible. Fact. But he's, and he's yeah. a nice guy too. Yeah. Oh yes, good guy. Yes. Yeah. Well, my last trip to Memphis sadly didn't go as planned. Uh, my grandfather turned eighty at the turn of this year in twenty twenty three, and uh, we all went to Memphis to take him to Graceland for his birthday because the only time he'd ever gotten the chance to go with my grandmother, who's no longer with us. Um, they parked their car and they went to buy their tickets and my grandmother had forgotten something in the car or sunglasses or something. And literally by the time they turned around, somebody had broken in the car and stolen everything out of it. So they saw Graceland from across the street, but they spent their entire time at the Memphis Police Department filing. Wow. And of course, nothing ever came of it. And how long ago was that? Know, oh, it was quite some years ago, at least yeah. 10 for sure. But yeah. um Long story short, my grandfather is just such a huge role model for me. Somebody I'm named after. His name's John. And um, he's just such an amazing man and uh, role model because he has always put others before himself. And I know that that's something that, you know, we all say we strive for. But no, he really did it. He uh, was a bridge for my mom's side of the family and just really was a stabilizer and could do a whole other podcast on that. But we won't. But, uh, you know, he's never wanted uh, anything for himself. Everything else has come for us. So we all pitched in, got him to Memphis, got him to Graceland. And it was when we had that ice storm this year. Oh. And so we got to the Graceland Guest House Hotel and we got iced in to the hotel. They closed Graceland the next day when we were supposed to go. So we've got him there with my grandmother when he got robbed and earlier this year and he's only ever gotten to see it from the gates out of the street we've never oh, actually got him to go oh. in so hopefully someday hopefully someday but um yeah that was the last time i was there and i was sad because you know you can always turn your trip around with a visit to marlowe's and even marlowe's was closed because <laughs> of the ice so yeah, that, that was tough to be so close and uh not get to go but the gentleman we were talking about with his collection he was so kind to invite us over and it was going to be a surprise for my grandfather that he didn't know where we were going. It's going to be me, my dad, my grandfather, and go. And, of course, you know that room where he has all that stuff displayed. Yeah. And that was the plan. But we got iced out of even getting to his house once oh, we got Lord. there. So it was just – it was a real nightmare. But, um, you know, my grandfather still just looks back at it and smiles even being that close. It just tells you what kind of guy he is. That's and, cool. um, you know, I hope to be half the man he is. So Yes, sir. That's cool, I have uh, – my grandfather was very, very um... – influential in my life and i think trey could say the same about his guys oh, definitely both of my yeah. granddads yeah i just we're three yeah. lucky guys so we could wish your granddad that. you wish your granddads could be with us forever <laughs> and i could tell you this as a grandfather there's nothing better than them grandkids and 
I, I just hope I, I've said this recently that I hope that I was as much of a joy to my grandparents as my grandkids are to me. I just, I hope that, and they made me feel that way. Anyway, I will say that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Grandparents, very special relationship. Uh, my grandfather, who I just mentioned is my last living grandparent. So I uh, always, always cherish the time we get to oh, spend yeah. together for yeah, sure. Do it, Jonathan. Yeah. That's cool stuff. So you, um, I know you play a lot of music. Are you playing out touring? You're doing anything like that right now? Yeah, truth be told, my love for music and where I get my fulfillment actually comes from the writing and recording side. So mm -hmm. I do play out several times a year, but um, it, it's interesting. You know, it's one of those things that when I tell this to people, they think like, oh, you're a musician and you're not playing out all the time. And it's like, I'm thrilled for people to do that. And, you know, I'd love to do so as well, but it's just not really what fulfills me, you mm -hmm. know, the sitting down and writing and putting words to music and then figuring out how we're going to do that in the studio. And then of course, like having music on vinyl and, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to get good radio play with my stuff. That's really what sets my soul on fire. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I put more of my focus, um, getting ready to do album number three here early next year. So a lot of fun stuff on the way for sure. But yeah, that's cool. And, uh, and look, it's a lot, it's hard, uh, traveling. You know, oh, yes. I, I traveled yes. on touring all that stuff for a period of time, and it's it's not as glamorous as, as you think it is. That bus, yeah. not, I can't sleep on the bus. And I've always thought that, too, yeah. even with your A-list touring guys. It's like, you know, the two-hour show and, let's say, the green room and meet and greet after the show, those are all the highs. But everything in between that of the logistics and buses and planes and, you know, waiting at airports and things like that, it, it definitely pans out for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, really, but I'll say, didn't you tell me a story like how you would like drive all overnight to get back to work? Oh yeah. Well, well, what you're talking about is uh, we did a show in Las Vegas and we flew back. Um, I mean, there's all, it's, there's a thousand different stories for that, but you fly back, you know, back in the day when I was playing music, and working, I worked full time and played, did 140 dates a year with the band. Man, wow. I would, it's just, I slept basically, I would catch up and sleep all day Sunday and then go wow. again. And um, and so I regret it on some level because I didn't spend the time with my kids when they were little like I should have. I was I was playing music. I was gone all the time, you know. And uh, and it was fun, but it never really it never turned into anything of of any substance, you know. So I regret doing it. Other than than we got to play music, but you know I got to play music at church. I was a bass player at my church for ten years, and um, the beauty of that was no traveling. You walk in there, and your amp is there, and you plug your bass in, you turn your amp on, you tune up, you're ready to roll. And can't beat that. <laughs> you know, you practice one hour before church. You play the church service and you're done till the next Wednesday. You know, I play Wednesday nights and Sundays, but I got uh, more fulfillment out of that than I did traveling and playing. You know, boy, you're talking about hard. Um, we did uh, four 45 minute sets. So you oh play 45 gosh. minutes, rest for 15 minutes, 45 minutes, and it would start at 10. You play till two. Then if you wow. were not playing anywhere, if you were not playing there the next night, you tore everything down. I'd go home. Uh, the next night we had to be at the place and set up and then play that night. And uh, I even had it where we had two PAs where we would set up and play at one place on Friday and Saturday night, somewhere else during the day on Saturday or a place on Thursday night, a different place. And, and then I would go do festivals during the day on Saturday. And so wow. it was a lot, it was, it was hard. It was, I, I enjoyed it. I don't uh, wish that on anybody. And, um, you know, I played a lot of music, but I hadn't played any music now in um, uh, with a band in, I don't know, five years, four years. It's been a long time. Yeah, I've done a little bit of studio stuff, but other than that, um, playing out is, it's a, it's a challenge. About five years ago, I was touring and opening for a Christian country band called Jackson Heights. And uh, my video stuff was taking off so much that I couldn't do both. So I had to make a decision. And I get a lot more fulfillment. Like you were saying, you get fulfillment out of recording. I get more fulfillment out of making videos than I ever did 
recording and writing and all that kind of stuff. I never, I'll be honest with you, Jonathan, I never recorded anything that I went, yep, that's what I was looking for right there. You know? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I've never, I've never completed that, but I've made videos where I went, yep, that's what I'm looking for right there. So it's one of those things, you know, it's a soccer. Yeah, I spent, uh, I spent my formative years as a teenager playing Ringo in a Beatles tribute band up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, well, up the South of Pittsburgh, but um, I really feel like I got a lot of my uh, playing live. Like I got to scratch that itch so much because even as teenagers, we were playing three or four times a month consistently all year. And, you know, as teenagers, that sure beat working at a drive through or a car wash, Absolutely. you know, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I learned a lot of like managerial skills and social media skills that um, although both of those things have changed quite a bit in the last, you know, 15 plus years. It's definitely been really interesting that that like laid the seeds for everything that came later as far as like uh, branding and as far as presentation and everything goes. I mean, I just learned so much uh, during that time that I was a sponge and uh, I I suppose I'm grateful to say it's still paying dividends all these years later. So yeah, uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And it's kind of funny that I went from being in a Beatles tribute band to writing music that sounds like it could be in a Beatles tribute band, but um, I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm grateful for the way that the cards have hit the table. So is that the first band you played in back then? Were you a drummer? I was. Yeah. Okay. And I still play drums quite a bit, but yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm of course writing on guitar and everything. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun back then. And um, it was cool. Cause we changed some things up. Like I'd sing some Paul songs uh, cause you know, as Ringo, you got about 13 songs to pick from yeah. and you know, yellow submarine night after night after night, <laughs> yeah. eventually you want to do a little all my loving too. So, yeah. uh, it, it was fun. It was a great time, great formative years. And, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. And now I have all the guitars from it still. Yes, you do. And I actually, <laughs> my first band, I was a drummer. I played drums oh, there you for go. several years. Yeah. And, um, I just, I, I have drums in fact, sitting right over there. We're and talking about drums. Continue. What's this thing with DJ Fontana? Yeah. So let's yeah, talk we, about that. Yeah, we've got all kinds of fun stuff to talk about. So uh, this would have been in the summer of 2015. Uh, I was super fortunate to meet DJ Fontana, get to know him a little bit, and spend some time with him. Uh, my cool little memento is he gave me this signed huh. drum yeah. head. Super cool. That um, is cool. Yeah, he was an absolute sweetheart. He was so cool. And of course, being a drummer, um, I've been so fortunate to meet pretty much all of my drum heroes at this point. Um, DJ being very high toward the top of the list right after Ringo. And long story short, I got to meet him in 2015. Uh, A friend and a mentor of mine named Rob Shanahan, who is a music photographer. Uh, He actually has a new book out called Volume 2. Super cool book. Um, but he was in town for the NAMM show, which of course is like a music business, uh, music retail show that travels all over. And I was in Nashville that summer and they did a thing at a venue here called third and Lindsley. And it was called all the Kings men. And it was pretty much everybody who was alive and still playing and able to travel that had played with Elvis. And it was insane. Ronnie Tut on drums, backing vocalists left and right, guitar players left and right. I mean, it was insane. And they did like, if memory serves, it was like a full Elvis, uh, like 70s Vegas set list. Everything from the 2001 Space Odyssey opening all the way through the end. It was awesome. But um, at a certain point in the show, uh, they called out from the stage and said, well, folks, uh, he's not going to be playing tonight, but we do have a very, very special Elvis legacy guest in the audience. In the back, would you please give it up for DJ and his wife, Karen Fontana? And they put a little spotlight on him and DJ got up and gave a humble wave. And uh, afterward, Rob and I went over and spoke to DJ and Karen and Rob introduced himself, uh, you know, music photographer, Rob shoots for Ringo Starr, Aerosmith, the Rolling Stones, you name it. Um and Karen said, oh, wow, you're a photographer. That's amazing. You know, we don't have any recent photos of DJ with the kit. And we're both like the kit. Yeah. She's like, well, you know, the Elvis kit. Like, oh, my gosh. And long story short, they invited us over the following day. We both cleared our schedules. 
and uh, DJ lived in a very small, unassuming home. You would just drive by it and never know that one of the most influential drummers of all time lived there. And uh, he invited us in. He was kicked back on the couch watching NCIS. And he kind of walked us through his house before we went upstairs to see the drum kit. And he had his uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame trophy from his induction. He had a really cool... Uh, I, I guess it was the original. It was like a petition that a bunch of drummers had signed Ringo, Jim Keltner, it basically vouching for a DJ to be inducted into the hall of fame, which I didn't even know existed. Probably nobody does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he had that framed and hanging on the wall and it was so funny. He had a room off to the side where he had all his Elvis memorabilia and it's like, okay, short of immediate family members, who would have more interesting Elvis memorabilia than DJ, Scotty, and Bill? Because they were there from the inception onward, especially Scotty and Bill, but, uh, you know, to see everything. And it absolutely cracked me up, but also kind of warmed my heart in a certain way that one of DJ's shelves, he had two bookshelves that were kind of like facing each other, if that makes sense. And one of them was all just like mind blowing Elvis memorabilia and DJ memorabilia, which I'll mention in a minute. But the other was just like random Elvis stuff, like the Barbie doll with the gold trim box and like a lunch box that you would find at Cracker Barrel. Just like, I mean, it's Elvis stuff, so it's cool by nature of what it is, but it's not like mind blowing stuff. Like he just, yeah. yeah, he just got it because he liked it. And I just yeah. always thought that that was such a neat reflection of how I got to know him the little bit that I did that you know he was so unassuming and kind and humble and it's just so amazing but I'll go ahead and show you in this book of Rob's here's the photo of DJ that we took yeah. so there you go yeah, with the drum cover. kit that's the drums and that's a yep. calf skin on the front of the bass drum you could see that in the Ed Sullivan photos and all that stuff uh, and there's the photos he had hanging on the wall behind as well. So he had yeah. the photos of Get in there. Uh, yeah. yeah, Elvis playing and stuff. And those were actually the eight by tens that DJ used to sign. So super cool. And DJ let Rob and I take photos with the drum set, which was just mind blowingly cool. And of course, I'm a drummer, as we mentioned. And, you know, we're walking around the drum kit looking at it, da da da. And I mentioned to DJ, Oh, I love, you know, your symbol has got a crack in it. There was a big chunk taken out of it uh, where, you know, usually something like that, it's been dropped or something really heavy cracked it. It was like the size of my thumb taken out of the symbol. And I uh, said, oh, I love that everything's so worn. And I said, I can't help but notice all your drum heads so marked up. When's the last time you changed them? And if memory serves, he kind of had his hands in his pockets and had his shoulders forward. And he goes, never changed them. They're original. Really? And he said, yeah, no, cool. why? If they're not yeah. broken. Yeah. And so I'm standing behind the drum set looking at him. And I look down and the snare drum is just as marked up and hit as possible. And I'm looking down and I'm thinking, okay, that one's Hound Dog. That one's Return to Sender. <laughs> that one's Jailhouse Rock. Because if you literally never changed them. They played, yeah. Everything, yeah. 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 So to make a long story short, um, it, it was just unbelievable. We're looking around at the kit and Rob knows the uh, DW folks pretty well. And of mm -hmm. course, DW owns Gretsch drums. They bought them out a number of years ago. And he also knows uh, Charlie Watts's drum tech. And of course, mm -hmm. Charlie was still with us at the time. And so Rob starts sending some photos to Gretsch and to Charlie's drum tech and, you know, just nerding out about drum stuff. And to make a long story short, uh, DJ's kit had the Gretsch round badge on it, which is like if you're holding the drum, the badge is kind of where the sound hole is. Mm -hmm. And they had a couple different variations, well, more than a couple of different variations throughout the history of Gretsch. Making a long story short, the wrap, uh, the finish on DJ's drums technically should not exist with a round badge. Those two things were never really offered at the same time. So putting all these puzzle pieces together, not only was this set historically significant because of it being on the Ed Sullivan show, all of the Elvis recordings, the movies, everything, but also it's a drum set that technically shouldn't even exist. So even if Joe Schmo had played it, 
it would be a pretty much one-off drum set to begin with. And so we started talking with DJ and Karen and, uh, you know, we're saying, oh, you know, what, what, what do you do with the kid? And Karen kind of uh, humbly was like, well, you know, it just sits here. We get hit up all the time by like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and things like that. And they want it, but they don't want to pay for it. They just want it to be on loan and displayed. And, you know, we know that it has value and significance and we would love for it to go somewhere that it's appreciated. But also, you know, we'd love to kind of enjoy our golden years here and use this drum kit as a way to do that. And so long story short, there's only so much detail I can give, but the drum set ended up in the hands of Charlie Watts, who bought it. And Charlie uh, has had a drum warehouse on his estate in England where he kept cars and he kept drum sets. And he never had a driver's license in his entire life. So he just bought cars to sit in them. He wouldn't know what to do with it. But he would have the drum sets in there and the cars. And that's where the drums are today uh, in Charlie Watts' estate at this point, because unfortunately he's no longer here. But uh, yeah, Charlie took care of DJ. I can say that. And it was really uh, amazing to have just a tiny, tiny little sliver of a part in that happening. And it was really interesting too. A couple of years later, um, I actually got to meet Charlie very, very briefly in Los Angeles. Um, working with Rob again, we spent an entire day in Palm Springs. Uh, we were with Hal Blaine at his house for eight hours. Wow. And Hal Blaine, for those that don't know, was the drummer for the Wrecking Crew, played on five figures worth of hits. I believe he was on 40 top 10 hits. I mean, just unbelievable career the most recorded Legend. drummer of all time and uh the plan was because how was i believe 89 at the time and uh the plan was just to go and do a quick photo shoot with him and just do a I quick know. interview like you, maybe like everyone <laughs> oh there we go that means so, you got three minutes there we go i'll make this story very quick it was supposed to be a quick interview with how and it ended up being eight hours where he talked elvis the monkeys everybody he recorded with and then uh elvis excuse me elvis is on my mind now how's 90th birthday party was coming up very soon and he invited us from the photo and film crew that went to his house to his birthday party and all kinds of famous people showed up at this party but charlie watts showed up at hal blaine's birthday and um that was just incredible to connect all those dots and get just a brief moment with charlie there and kind of bring the whole story full circle with the DJ story as That's well. really cool. Yeah, and really I, you may have mentioned that, but Charlie Watts is the drummer for the Rolling Stones. For people Correct, for those that, that don't know. And um, well, I actually have a tie to that story. And that is, I mentioned that I played bass at my church. The, our drummer at my church, the band that I played in, worked for a drum cartridge company. And he's actually the one that went over there and got the drums and packaged them up and shipped them to Charlie. And, Amazing. Uh, what he a small world. told me about that. At, you know, he was like, man, you won't believe what I just did. It showed me yeah. you know, they had pictures of it. It was pretty crazy. And uh, yeah, it's, it is a small world. It's incredible. Hey, Jonathan, uh, before we go, can you share uh, one story that DJ told you about being on the road with Elvis or anything that you remember? Is there yes. I, I asked him a very specific question that it's a drummer I always wanted to know. And he gave me the best answer ever so you think of all the great elvis songs and you know there's so much you could say about elvis's performance scotty's guitar playing bill's bass playing and then of course dj's drumming and i wanted to know how he came up with the groove on i got stung because as a drummer it's a um dun, uh, i got stung. it just it's got a really interesting backbeat that isn't the way nine out of ten drummers would sit down to do it and so, you know, we were making small talk and I uh, asked him, I said, DJ, you know, as a drummer, I've always wanted to know, how did you get in the groove of I Got Stung? How did you come up with that? And he kind of put his hands up like this and he goes, I played whatever the king wanted me to. I'm like, gosh, <laughs> that is the coolest answer ever. <laughs> I love it. Love That's it, man. That's great stuff. Well, thank so, you so much. It's tell been them great how to they be can on the show. find you, Jonathan. Sure. So uh, there's my name right there exact spelling and everything i'm a very googleable person so you can find me on whatever streaming platform you want social media platform i'm always happy to uh chat with the elvis fans and beatles fans and well i'm into a lot of different things so 
Um, yeah, you can search Jonathan Pushkar, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, my website, jonathanpushkar.com. It's all out there, and I'll see you guys there. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming and doing this. And, uh, and we're going to uh, talk further in another one about another subject. Don't miss it, friends, next week. Thank you, John. Appreciate you. you. Hey, tighten up every chance you get. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you, Trey. And All right, there we go. You guys, this was, this was a lot of fun and very insightful. That was awesome. Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all.